Uh, joining us now, Jeremy Bash, former chief of staff to Leon Panetta at the Pentagon and the CIA, and New York Times diplomatic correspondent Michael Crowley. Uh, Jeremy, first of all, on that intel, which, you know, clearly, according to NBC News, was provided by the U.S. to the Brits, the Brits announced it, but also it comes just days after the State Department and the Treasury sanctioned four Ukrainians, including two sitting parliament members, and Blinken has been warning all over Europe that this doesn't have to be a physical invasion or even the incursion that, you know, the president stumbled with at his news conference Wednesday. It could be efforts to topple the Zelensky government. It could be all kinds of, you know, insurgencies, false flag operations. And still, Blinken pointing out there's a window for diplomacy here between Secretary Blinken and the Foreign Minister Lavrov when I was covering that on Friday. Yeah, two points, Andrea. First, with respect to the intelligence picture, throughout this crisis, we've been collecting intelligence, sharing it with our key partners, both our closest Five Eyes partners, including the British, but also the rest of the NATO alliance. In fact, I think if you talk to U.S. officials, what you'll hear is that it really wasn't until late in 2021 when we were able to declassify, or I should say classify for release to our NATO allies, a lot of our intelligence about what Putin's ambitions were and what the force posture he was uh, arraying on the border of Ukraine looked like, that NATO really perked up and realized, oh my goodness, this is a serious crisis. We all have to get aligned. So using intelligence to get the NATO alliance together and unified is, is something that has occurred and will have to occur in the future. And then with respect to your second point, Andrea, yes, you know, Vladimir Putin has a lot of tools at his disposal. He's great at the gray zone, at the hybrid warfare. As, uh, as, as people say, doing things short of armed conflict, including covert activities, including things that he can try to deny, little green men, cyber activities, things that are not so kinetic. And you won't see something go boom, but will have a political, military or economic effect on degrading uh, Ukraine. And so that's something that the United States and our allies are certainly aware of. And we're going to respond in force, as President Biden made clear last week. And Michael Crowley, you were in Berlin, importantly, you were in Kiev and also in Berlin with Secretary Blinken when he was trying to pull together the NATO allies and smooth over cracks in the allies, particularly Germany and France. And we saw some of that when you and I were together in Geneva as well. So let's talk about Germany, uh, because my reporting is that Germany is having an internal debate right now over whether or not to approve the uh, artillery that Estonia wants to provide to Ukraine, which has German-made German parts. And their export controls on arms are similar to ours, that Germany has to approve it if uh, Estonia wants to sell to a third country or provide to a third country, and that there is some pushback. I think the Americans would be very unhappy if Germany comes out front and says to Estonia, you can't provide it, but they are taking their time. It's been three or four days now while Estonia applied for them, and they haven't done that in France. Macron trying to suggest that the EU and France have their separate talks with Lavrov and the Russians rather than they be only the U.S. leadership. So let's talk about France and Germany. That's right, Andrea. You know, the, really one of the core messages of the Biden administration that uh, you and I have heard so many times from Secretary Blinken, including in Europe this week, is this idea of uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder unity with our NATO and European allies in deterring Russia and threatening these swift and, you know, massive sanctions that Secretary Blinken keeps warning of. I think the reality, when you look more closely at it, is that there is not unity on how to respond. Um, Germany, uh, France and Germany in particular, uh, have a lot to lose uh, from an economic fight with Russia. They are heavily dependent on Russia economically. The Germans get a vast amount of their energy supplies uh, from Russia. That's one reason we are seeing this Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, uh, and, and one factor there is that Germany is moving away from nuclear power and so more dependent on things like natural gas. So the Germans and the French uh, they don't want, nobody wants a war with Russia, but the Germans and the French stand to lose a lot from an economic war with Russia. The United States has very few economic ties to Russia, and we wouldn't actually lose all that much as a result. And you are seeing all kinds of uh, instances like this, Andrea. I would remind you also, you probably saw the reporting that when the British flew uh, Javelin anti-tank missiles into Kyiv, 
uh, last week. And in fact, we parked uh, when Blinken landed right next to a British plane that had just finished unloading those missiles. Um, that, uh, that military jet did not fly over German airspace. I'm not sure if it was confirmed what the reason was, but it sure looked like the Germans were essentially saying, we don't want any part of sending arms to Russia right now. They don't want to escalate. And uh, that's a problem for the Biden administration. And when you were in Berlin, Blinken was meeting with the French, the British, as well as the Germans, that there was already an attempt. And one of the things that the president said, you know, on Wednesday night was that the allies were not united and undercut what Blinken was doing, but it was telling the truth out loud, speaking truth uh, about the situation. Jeremy, uh, one of the other factors here is what kinds of economic sanctions. And I reported in early January that they were considering export controls on semiconductors and other high-tech components that Russia needs for its industrial complex. Now that's been ramped up. That's one of the things that is front and center. How you know, important could that be as a pressure tactic against Russia? Yeah, we are definitely hearing, Andrea, that the Commerce Department and other parts of the U.S. government are, are preparing a significant set of restrictions, export controls, changes to the, uh, the rules and regulations that govern how technology can go to Russia. And I think this is very important because it's a way to deprive the Russian economy of certain uh, technologies. Uh, but look, th this has to be calibrated and done with precision because, as Michael pointed out, you know, no tool of statecraft is perfect. Obviously, if there was a perfect tool, we'd employ it. But whether you engage in military actions, you always worry about collateral damage and collateral effects. When you engage in cyber attacks, you have to worry that that malware is going to get out there and can't be used against you. But so, too, with economic issues and sanctions. You know, when we engage in sanctions, it hurts not just the Russian economy, but the counterparty. And there may be European countries, American companies that are going to be coming here looking for exemptions to make sure that those are well calibrated. So this may erode over time. And just to point out to all of our viewers and to all of you that, importantly, the president has added a three o'clock event with the European leaders now to his schedule, which is a video conference with all the European leaders on, obviously, Ukraine and Russia. So that is happening this afternoon. That had not been previously announced. So they're clearly trying to shore up this alliance after Blinken met with his counterparts in the EU, EU earlier this morning. Thanks to all of you and to Matt Bradley as well in Ukraine.